there for the camp recording. Yeah. Right. All right, and uh, Mark is our first speaker. Let's give him another round of applause. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi there. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for coming out on a Monday night. I don't know about you, but this was a Monday for me, and it was quite daunting to come here and talk in front of you. So, well, thank you for being here. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about hooks. Uh, but first of all, I want to ask you if you're using hooks at all, if you've heard of them to start with. So if you have heard of them, raise your hand. If you're using them, keep your hand up. If you're using them in production at work, keep your hand up. Okay, not many people. That's well. A few, but not, not a huge amount. So for you, I'm sorry, this is going to be a little boring because it's kind of an introduction to the topic. But hopefully, since there is a bit of live coding, I'm going to fuck up and that will help you have a laugh. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, refactoring off the hook, I need to introduce um, the topic a little bit first. So you might have heard of React. Um, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> So React is a declarative uh, component base, layer ones right everywhere according to the React, uh, React docs. Um, in this case, like tonight, we're going to focus specifically on the component base part of it. And uh, we're going to dig into what a component looks like. I think that the, the characteristic of a component specifically is what makes it re-render. Um, so a component could, could re-render whether the props that are injected from outside change or whether the internal st state changes. We all know that, right? So th this could be a diagram of how a component, um, of the mental model that we might have about a component. And in terms of coding, the component could be a simple function, um, like this. We all written code like this. Uh, and this is mostly what we do when we don't need a state. Uh, or if we need a state, that is going to be more of a class, right? That's, that's the kind of standard components we've been working with for a long time now. Um, the thing is, neither model really captures what React a React component is. And this is not something I made up myself. This is something that Dan Abramov said. And I know, I know. I mean, this, this image of him has been used many, many times, and <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, so what, did, uh, what Dan uh, tweeted at some point was that these two models were insufficient to uh, describe React. And the reason why these two models were insufficient is because the pure function doesn't describe local state, which is an essential React uh, feature, as we saw before, like we, we said before, like you would write a function component if you didn't need to handle an uh, internal state. Uh, but on the other hand, the class model doesn't really explain the pure render issue. That is a, oh God, I repeated this word many, many times. How do you pronounce that? This, I'm Italian, sorry, I, I can't. This, uh, Boeing? This, thank you. Uh, someone nodding, that was great, thank you. Um, and the lack of direct instantiation and receiving the props. So that's why we're here tonight. Uh, I'm Marco, you can find me everywhere as Chad Max, my pronouns are he, him, in case you have to talk about me. And tonight, we're going to talk about colors. That's quite a twist. So a while back, I was looking online, trying to find inspiration for a pet project, and I came across this presentation from Lynn Fisher. If you don't know her, um, she's an amazing uh, front-end developer, and she's quite well known for a single div. You might have seen this lately. Uh, on Twitter, this is uh, one div that has been styled. Uh, there is a link down there, but you can find it on Twitter everywhere. Um, this is the cyber trunk that Tesla is building. Um, and yeah, she took a div and styled it to look like it. Anyway, during the presentation, she, she was presenting uh, her pet projects, uh, one of which was this. This is a pet project where she collected all the airport codes uh, of the world and added some um, information. She open sourced it, and people started contributing. And I think it was like a fantastic, a very encyclopedic and complete example of a pet project. I thought, well, um, that suits well my middle age crisis. I should do something similar. So I started looking on um, Wikipedia to find a list of things that would make me, uh, give me the same sense of completeness. And I found, as it happens, a, a list of colors in alphabetical order. So these are named colors according to Wikipedia. So what I did was to build a website with it, of course, because that's what I do. And the component that is holding the, the app is a quite complex component in itself. Like, there isn't anything complex going on, but the, it's a very busy component in the end. Um, there is um, a state 
to start with, um, I can sort the colors with some helpers that help me figure out the hacks or the um, brightness of the color and stuff like that. I can filter with search, and I can change the color by clicking on it. Like again, it's not anything particularly complex, but there are some functions there, and readability of this component is, is kind of compromised because of that. Um, I'm not going to focus on the UI at all, because this is more about state management in itself. Um, so again, now I'm going to refactor this component to use UX. I don't expect any one of you to follow line by line what I'm doing. What I'm trying to prove is that it's kind of simple to do that, um, and it's kind of quick as well. So bear with me a second while it's set up. Okay. That was quick. Um, so the <laughs> this is the component. Uh, again, there are some constant. I just want to go through quickly. Uh, there is a state. The state has the original list of colors that are available on the website. Uh, there is a color filter which holds the search, uh, the value of the search. Uh, there is a default sorting and some styles. And that's because when I click on a color, I want the background to change and the color of the of the font to be kind of reasonably contrasted for reading. That, that's it. It's like there isn't there isn't anything specifically. Okay, that, that's the website. So again, what I'm going to do is transform that to uh, use hooks. So the first things first, I'm going to comment out everything, uh, and I'm going to export a function because hooks can be used only in function components. And then I'm going to return my, the content of my render, mostly because, um, yeah, I'm gonna, not going to touch that anyway. So that's, that's it. So first, good. Of course, my linter would complain about a few things. Um, but let's start with, with the state. So I'm going to take the state. I, I'm going to try to bring these things to use um, the use state component. Uh, sorry, the use state hook. God, it's Monday. It's really Monday. So I'm going to start, start with the um, original list. And as you can see, that use state returns an array. The first uh, item in the array is the actual value that, um, that where the state is old, uh, is alt. And the second function is the setter for that state to change. So that should be enough to represent this. And then what I'm going to do is take the things that change that state. So for example, the filter. Let's start with this one. So I'm going to say that my filter function uh, takes the, it's going to be I use callback. And we're going to see later why. But again, bear with me for the minute. And sorry. current filter. I'm going to get this, and then I'm going to set the colors to be the colors that I filtered out with the current filter. That's about it. And again, if I go back to my function, that's the same thing. Um, the only thing I need to change is that this is not going to be this filter anymore. This is going to be filter because it's a local variable, right? Um, well, OK, this complaints because of that, I think. It's not defined. Set colors. Sorry. OK. okay. So that was it. The filters are done. Um, I need to do the, the same for the rest of, of the things, though. So I'm going to do the current filter as well. So um, for the current filter, I need to do something more because I need to alt the state uh, of the filters. So current filter, set current filter from use state. And then it's empty by default. This is my default state. And then I'm going to need to bring my filter function. Oh, sorry, I already did the filter function. What am I doing? Oh, yes. Sorry. I made a mistake. Better. 
Okay, so that was the current filter. Uh, current sort by, same. So I have a constant with the current sort by, a set current sort by, use state, and my default sort by, which is the name. And again, when I change and I want to change the sort by, I'm going to create a local variable that is called sort by. Use callback. And instead of setting the state like this, I'm going to do a uh, set colors with this. And as you may as you may see, I, I'm not taking the current value of colors. This is because um, the setter can take a function and inject the current value, so I don't have to bring it to, to execute it myself. And then the, the set current sort by is going to take the sort by value. And that's about it. So you're seeing. You, sorry, um, so you see where I'm going with this, and I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, uh, but it's like one function missing, uh, which is the um, on color change. Um, I have a um, cheating folder where I actually did the thing, um, just to show you how different it is. But um, this is it. I, as I mentioned before, we have the style and the set style, um, and the things change according to what we said before. That's about it. It's quite fast in the refactoring itself. Also, again, Monday night, I've been coding all day. Please, give me some slack. Um, anyway, <laughs> back to the presentation. This is the old live coding I've got, so easy. Um, anyway, hooks. I introduced a couple of hooks. Uh, let's talk about hooks in general first, and then we, we can go through seeing each one of them. Um, so hooks, in, uh, according to the React documentation, are opt-in, 100% backward compatible, and available now, where now means last year in October, basically. Um, the first uh, hook we saw was useState. Uh, as I mentioned before, useState comes with an returns an array. Uh, the first item of the array is the value that is currently held in the state, and the second argument is the function to set the state itself. And use states can be invoked with any value um, to set the default state. Um, when you invoke the set color change, so when you, when you set the state, you can pass a function in, uh, and so you can do also in the initial state. Um, and so th this is exactly doing the same thing. Like you can invoke the function or use the current value and pass it in. They do exactly the same. Uh, and when you enqueue, well, when you put a couple of set state in a row, they get enqueued so you don't get random re-renders with inconsistent states across. So far, so good. Um, the second one that we saw was the use callback. Um, the use callback is helpful because React tends to re-render if the prop has changed. Um, with use callback, we make sure that the variable sort by never changes unless uh, we want. So use callback is basically memoizing the instance of the function so that is always the same when it's passed in as a prop. So the children component wouldn't re-render for no reason. A step forward for that, though, is um, to use reducer. Um, I guess there is at least one of you that is comfortable with Redux. Raise your hand, please. Some. OK. I hope that you've seen um, what a reducer looks like, at least in examples, if you are not familiar with Redux, because user reducer is pretty much um, similar. So the component that we wrote with the changes I made introducing hooks is still a quite busy component. I mean, it's not a class anymore. It's, you might consider it more readable or not. Um, but it's still quite busy in itself. Um, so user reducer could help us making it a little uh, clearer, and also the couple the business logic from the actual rendering logic. Um, user reducer works very similarly to what you state. Uh, looks very similar to what you uh, you state. Is uh, the only difference is that it takes two parameters. One is the reducers, is the reducer function. The other one is the default state. Um, the reducer function, as I mentioned before, is very similar to what a reducer looks like for uh, Redux. So is is a function that takes the default, the, the current state, and uh, an action object, and based on the type of the action, would modify the state. 
Again, if you're familiar with Redux, this should be code that you've seen before or written before. If you're not, hopefully you've seen example for Redux. Um, but I um, suggest that you look into it because it's quite powerful in itself. The business logic is completely isolated, it's way more simple to test it, and it's not tied with the rendering anymore. Um, going back to the component, at this point we can do something similar to this. I applied some abstraction to avoid having to dispatch every single time, but ultimately uh, I use, use callback to have my um, modifiers for the state being invoked when needed. And uh, by doing this, I simplified my component quite a bit. And now everything that you've seen before that was super complex and long is a few lines of code, really. And that's because the business logic has been removed and isolated. Next, I know I'm going very quickly, but my, my understanding is that the time tonight is a bit tight. So um, I'm gonna introduce straight away the use effect, which is probably the most daunting uh, of the common ones, I would say. Um, so use effect is uh, a hook that accepts a function that contains imperative and possibly effectful code. Um, think it of an, an escape hatch from React's purely functional word into imperative words. Um, said like this, it sounds very complex and whoa. Uh, effectively, is all things that we do anyway in our apps. It's just that they don't really fit the model of what Redux, uh, React does. Um, is all things that are not declarative or that, yeah, don't, don't, are not pure rendering um, side effects. So an example that would, um, that would look, uh, of what this effect would look like is something like this. Um, with these effects, you can define uh, a fetch data function um, that takes the data and sets the color. Uh, if you add an endpoint, that would return colors, for example. Um, interesting enough, I haven't, I didn't put the, the, the use effect as an async function. I didn't pass the first argument as a, as a an async function. Uh, and we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, there is a reason why I didn't define it that way. Um, use effect is, um, takes a function, and again, I'm not using async, and it takes a list of dependencies. This is the same array you've seen before in use callback. Uh, the reason why it takes a list of dependencies is because the effect will, will be re-triggered at the change of that dependency. So in this case, specifically, if the prop ID would change, the effect would be re-triggered and you would fetch another color. If the prop ID doesn't change in the next render, that wouldn't happen, the effect would not be triggered. Um, in this way, we can actually reproduce some of the React life cycles for classes. Um, so if you have an empty array, that would be triggered once, which kind of maps to the component it mount. And Given the ability of returning a function um, that will tr be triggered when the component amounts, uh, this could replicate the component uh, did amount. Uh, the problem is that I think trying to replicate class um, life cycles with hooks is kind of an anti pattern, though, because the, the, the mental mode changes a little bit. And the question is not anymore when does the fact run, but what state the fact synchronizes with. So looking at the examples I made before, the, the, the true thing is that this um, effect without any array synchronizes with every changes. And then every re-render this effect gets um, executed. While this one synchronizes with no change. So it will be executed once and then never more. And the last one, as I mentioned before, uh, will be synchronized with the prop ID changes. So every single time the prop ID would change, this would trigger. Um, so again, I got to this point and I thought, well, okay, like, I mean, these are the basic hooks that uh, are the most used, um, but I wanted to show you a little bit more. So I kind of tried to dig into uh, what can I do with writing a custom component. And I thought that maybe looking at URL changes, because I'm a web person, so I want the URL to always reflect the content of my page. Um, can I do that with hooks? And the answer is, of course, yes, I can. Um, so I prepared these custom uh, implementation of hooks, I put together some hooks, uh, and I started thinking, okay, I want this hook to, uh, this effect to be synchronized with the change of those uh, two values, because those are the values that I want to maintain in the URL. Um, the first time that these things is triggered, uh, I want to restore the value that is in the URL, because when I refresh the page, I want the URL to be kind of the, source of truth of the content of my page. And then uh, when I do that, uh, I attach to the history, to the browser history, 
um, something that would modify the state of my app based on what's in the URL. So I get the data, the, the current filter and so current sort by from the data coming from the URL, and I apply that to my, um, to my uh, use state, uh, state setters. And again, the function to listen to the history looks something like that. Not that you, I, again, I don't expect you to read and understand every single step of the thing. Just, it does that, trust me. Um, and the next step is, um, and, and this is the callback that invokes that, uh, basically. The next step is, once I've done that, um, store the information that I did that, so that every single other time that something changes uh, in those variables, uh, so current sort by or current filter, instead of reading again from the URL, I actually update the URL to the new um, value that are in my state. So I switch the source of truth from the URL to the current state that the user is interacting with. Um, and that's kind of the function that does that. Again, simplified a little bit. So this is how it looks like, and it's not very complex in itself, and it would help me uh, all the state in, in the URL. Just to uh, very quickly, have a look how that will look like. Again, I, um, in my cheating folder, I done that. Ouch. That was me left coding. And when I change something here, as you can see, there is a default already. When I change something here, as you can see, the URL is here. And if I refresh, that's my state brought back. There is a flash of all the data because I didn't bother doing it well, but ultimately I could have done uh, managed that as well. Uh, and the URL is synced with my data changes. Cool. I can isolate that and bring that outside from my component though, because I don't really want to bring all that logic and keep it in the component. Um, so what, what we can do is apply some abstraction to that so that it becomes uh, a generic custom component that, that can take any value and any um, and all, all the state of any of anything that I want in my URL bar. Um, so in this case, I decided to go for this um, for this API for my custom component. As being a custom component, I can define the API how I want. And uh, I, these are the values that I want to maintain in the URL. These are the default. Okay, yeah. So these are the setters to change um, the state based on the URL. And ultimately, these are the default values in case my initial values are empty. Um, again, you could have you could have done something like this. Um, this is more like maybe hooks-like in terms of returning an array and all these things. But I found it way simpler than doing it the other way. And the changes to the com to the logic itself is not much. I'm going to wrap that around with a use query string sort of um, naming um, and export function. Is laid that in another file. Um, and then I need to change the dependencies so they're not too specific dependencies anymore. Uh, they, they should be generic values that might change. And so I do something like that. Uh, object values of the values object that they pass. Um, same thing for restoring the URL. Uh, I can now specifically invoke certain setters or certain values. Uh, what I need to do is to loop over the keys of my values and invoke the setter in the same position um, oh, sorry, you invoke the setter with the same with the same key, na key name, uh, passing either the value that I find in the URL or the one that is in the defaults. And ultimately, the sorry formatting. Ultimately, the last bit is as well here. I need to invoke my object history with the values. Again, I don't expect to um, have you understanding line by line. Just give a sense of how uh, we could work in abstraction with hooks. And in the same way, again, this is the, the, the abstraction point I had to apply in order to make this generic enough to be reused in, in other contexts. Um, there is a question around testing. Um, in terms of testing custom hooks, there are various strategy. I'm going to show you one that worked for me. It's not the one recommended by React Docs. Um, is, so given, given, my, my thinking, uh, <clears throat> given my thinking, I could uh, do a pretty much uh, very unit testy uh, version of my testing. I could mock out the two dependency that I actually use, which are my two um, uh, interaction with the history object, uh, abstraction around the history object. So I mock them. Um, and then I have a state setter function that I mock as well. 
and I created a component that has basically no UI and uses the, uh, the hook I wanted to test. And then at that point, I could mount a component, make sure that my listen to history has been called, uh, making sure that it has been called with what I want, and making sure that every time the state changes, um, the URL gets, uh, sorry, um, every time that the, the history gets read from the URL, uh, I can actually check that my set, setter, set state setter has been invoked with the correct value. Um, and I can check also the fact that is it, if there is no value, uh, is falling back to the default value. And in the same way, if I change the props and the cause of re-render, considering that I already mounted it, uh, now I can check that it's not calling the listen to history anymore, but is doing the object to history this time. And again, I could go further with testing, but like, as you can see, this is pretty much unit testing my stuff. Um, again, I recommend to read um, the React docs though, because there are other strategies to test hooks, uh, and especially when the hooks are not um, depending, like in my case, on um, external things you can mock, it could be easier to go the official way. Um, I'm close to an end here. I just have some FAQs because I knew that might not be time uh, for that. So very quickly, why hooks again? Um, the main reason is that they provide a better mental model of what a component is. Um, whether that's helpful for you right now, then no, but it's good to have a different way of thinking about components, uh, matching what a component actually is. Um, there is another reason though. Um, classes are expensive. Uh, especially for compilers. So when it comes to Bubble and the other compilers, just removing a class, remove half K of, um, of code, they come with a burner of, uh, no, I'm not convinced. <laughs> no, okay, um, never mind. Uh, I, I recommend just try and see what effects on your code base is. Um, they are stable, yes, they are definitely stable. Uh, there were some conversation at the beginning uh, within uh, the React team. Um, there are a few funny things, I'll post the, the, the slides online later. Uh, but yeah, there were a few conversation at some point then stepped in saying that there are things that they haven't figured out completely yet, uh, but mostly the hooks, that the, the, the default hooks are gonna be stable um, for a long time, I think. Um, are there more hooks? Uh, yes, a few more within React itself, um, and there are a lot of community-driven ones. There are a few links at the end of the slide with some resources about that. Um, should you start using them? It's up to you, really. They are available. They are not mandatory. Uh, they're backward compatible. You can introduce them as you go, not introduce them at all. It's, it's totally up to you. And classes are not disappearing. Not, the not for the foreseeable future. React team was super clear about that. There is no... Um, there is no reason to be scared or upgrade your um, your code base removing classes for that reason. Um, all in all, the most important takeaway, if you have to have one, is that uh, when you think you know something, it's good to stop a second and rethink how you know it. And I think this was the trigger of that thought for me. I'm not sure if you've ever played Uno, but um, yeah, that was life changing for me. So again, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the slides online later. There is um, some resources. Um, the Colors website is completely different now. Um, but yeah, that was me. Thanks a lot, Marco. So you've been exactly in time. Exactly. Like, thanks for that. Uh, so. Uh